Everybody say hey. hey. Everybody say ho. ho. Everybody say send me. Send me. Awesome. All right. You guys are lively. I'm surprised because I'll tell you what, I did not expect to sweat this much. If you noticed it, I'm probably the sweatiest band member right now, and I feel disgusting, but that's okay. We're going to have some fun tonight, right? We're going to have some fun tonight? Awesome. Glory to God. All right, let's just uh, bow our heads, because I believe that, that God wants to do something powerful here tonight. I don't, I don't say that as a cliche. I say that as a serious thing, because if you look at the news this past week uh, of everything going on in this world and in our country, I, I think that it's a time that we as believers, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then we need to take this message of the gospel more seriously than ever before. And I think there's nothing more dangerous to the kingdom of darkness than a group of young people like you guys that are passionate about the gospel. Because Satan is scared right now. The fact that you are here, the fact that you took time out of your schedule, it's summer. I know you could be doing so many other things, but you are here right now. And that terrifies the enemy. So I just, I just want to pray and believe that God is going to do something powerful, that he's going to rise you guys up, do something in this region that has never been seen before, that he's going to rise you up to do amazing, powerful things for the kingdom of God. So let's just bow our heads and let's just believe what God is going to do today. <sighs> Dear God, I, I thank you for who you are. God, we see what's going on in the world right now. We see all these terrible uh, just massacres and these things that are going on. And, and there's just there's an air of hopelessness in our world. God, people don't feel secure. They don't feel safe. They don't feel like there's something to live for tomorrow. Some people don't even feel that, that they can even take their next breath and they feel that their life isn't worth living anymore. But God, I believe in Jesus' name right now that you are going to begin to speak to the hearts of these young people. Uh, and God, not through my words, but God, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. God, shut me up if I have anything to say because I want everything today to be all about you, Lord. I want everything to be about you. I want to give you glory in every breath and everything I say tonight. So, God, I, I just pray that we would be awakened to your spirit today, that we would be in tune with your spirit, and we would just be ready to see what you send us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so first off, obviously, send me 16, the hashtag and all that good stuff. Uh, just to, to clarify on the verse, if you didn't already know it, uh, Isaiah 6, 8 says, Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should, uh, whom should I send as a messenger to this people who will go for us. I said, here I am, send me. And if you are uh, a little bit older, who still knows the fact that Lecrae has a song called Send Me? Yes? Okay, I'm showing my age a little bit because that's an album he put out probably well over 10 years ago and it's still golden. It might be a little old for the time now, but it's still good, go check it out if you like Lecrae. But anyway, there's that, and there's this band called Four Today, um, and they have a song that talks about, you know, here I am, God, send me to the world. And I believe that if we truly seek after the kingdom of God, and we seek after what he wants to do with our lives, that he's going to do amazing things. If you didn't already know, my name is Dan Gray. I actually grew up in this area, um, and it's funny because I grew up in this area, and your goal when I was growing up in this area was to, like, get out of Northeast PA. And, and it was, there was always all these stigmas about Northeast PA. And, you know, I always grew up in just such a negative atmosphere about what it was. And, and I think that if I could go back, the one thing I would do incredibly different is realize that this is such a mission field. We look at economically what's going on in this area. We look at spiritually what's going on in this area. The addictions, the alcoholism, the things that are just corrupting our societies, the things that are making people uh, just end their lives, to take their lives because they feel no hope. Guys, you guys are in the most amazing place to do ministry. You know what? I, I have the honor and privilege um, to go into to all the areas. I get to go into different areas of the country. Uh, I get to go work with uh, a music school in Brooklyn from time to time. Each summer, I usually go out. And I get to disciple them and teach them how to uh, go out and share the gospel with people on the streets. Um, I get the honor and privilege to go to different countries, to Peru, uh, to D Dominican Republic, and get to go to just all these areas. And, and in the book of Acts, there's this amazing passage. The last thing that Jesus said before he ascended. And you got to keep in mind, like, he has his disciples. These guys are following him all around. He's doing all these miracles. He dies on the cross. He shows up again. And one thing he says, and if somebody dies and it is risen from the grave, and they're like, yo, I'm about to leave, so I got one more thing to say, it's usually pretty important. So he said that, you know what, you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Wait for that power. And then I'm going to send you into Jerusalem, to uh, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And basically what that means is that 
uh, Jerusalem for them was their local region. And then Judea and Samaria was the other regions around it. And then to the ends of the earth, it's like going to mission trips in these other countries. And sometimes I, I, I think that it's a struggle for us to do that first step, to reach our own communities. Because when you go over to another country, it's still difficult sometimes, but you're going somewhere where you don't have to care as much because those people don't know you and they're not going to see you again for a while. But here, you've got something to risk. You've got your own personal reputation. You've got your own personal standing in your, in your friend circles, in your community, in your schools. And you know what? If we can just, as a unified body of Christ of young people, Say, you know what, I will go wherever you call me, God. I don't care about my personal reputation. I don't care about what people think of me. If people think I'm some weirdo Christian that's too passionate about Jesus. Because that's, that's the thing is the world will make fun of you because they don't understand the light that you have in your life. They will say all these things. But when it comes down to it, when, when things hit the fan when, when, and life gets crazy and you still have hope and you still have joy in your heart, even with everything going on in the world and the things going on in your life, they're going to question. They're going to step back and they're say, wait a second. You know what? I may have made fun of that person, but they have something I don't have, and I don't understand it. And you have the opportunity to reach them. So uh, today I just want to share this message called Keys to the Kingdom. Um, and it's, uh, first off, the, the first part of this, talking about the kingdom. I'm going to share a passage in the book of Matthew, and it's in 6, 31 through 34. It says, so don't worry about, about uh, these things, saying, what will I eat, what will I drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. For, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. So... See, it says to seek the kingdom of God. And sometimes here on earth, we get so caught up in what's happening right now. We get caught up with things that haven't even happened yet. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of James. And in the beginning of the book of James, it talks about that it says your life is like a vapor or a mist in the wind. It's there for a moment and it's gone. We're not promised tomorrow. And sometimes we forget that. And we get so caught up with everything. So some of you have probably seen this illustration before. But all right, so see this rope goes into that door over there. Just pretend it goes out the building. And this white part just goes out the building around the world a million times. Okay? So this is eternity. Okay? It never ends. Okay? And this here is your time on earth. All right? Really want you to think about that. So this all, 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 all of this. Is eternity. And this is our time here on earth. For some of you, that's another 90 years. For some of you, that's another, well, depending on, depending on how old you are, that would be pretty rad to be over 100 years old. But, you know, for some of you, that might be another 20 years. We don't really know what that time is. But the thing is, we're so consumed about, oh, wait, what school am I going to go to? What is this? And what is this? What is this? What is this? But this verse here says something else. It says, to keep your eyes on the kingdom. To seek the kingdom of God above all else. And that's hard. That takes humility. And that's something that I want us to really think about as we go into this Send Me 16. Are we going to seek the kingdom of God above our own personal preferences? Above our own comfort zones? Are we going to love our brothers and sisters? Are we going to love our neighbor? Your neighbor is not just, and Jesus talked about this in a parable uh, in the New Testament, he says, you know, who is your neighbor? And he goes into this whole long story of the parable uh, of the Good Samaritan. And it basically comes down to this. Everyone here, everyone out there, all those people who are lost and broken and stuck in addiction and have no hope in their life, that is your neighbor. So we're going to seek the kingdom of God. Not just these next couple days, but the rest of our lives. I, I, I believe that that's the call God wants to place in our lives. So I had an acrostic for, uh, for the word keys. We're going to start off with the first letter, which is K. And it talks about King Jesus. All right. Now, talking about a king is something kind of weird and foreign for us because we're in America where there's a president. Okay. And, you know, with a king, especially in the older days, there was a lot more importance placed on respecting the king. Because if you disrespected the king, it was, you know, off of your head or you would go to jail and it was, it was bad. Like, there were consequences for disrespecting the king. 
But we live in a country where, you know, it's almost expected to talk crap on the president. You know, we don't really respect, you know, even people we disagree with. That's just not the way we function. So sometimes in America, we don't really get this whole following King Jesus. But we need to understand that following Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ today, you need to know that it's not just something where you go up and you say some prayer and then that's it. You know that it is a relationship. That you need to submit to his authority to follow in his footsteps. And if you really read the New Testament, some, a lot of people get it wrong. They have all these personal ideas. They want to form Jesus into their own personal idea of what Jesus was. But then when you look at the New Testament, you read through. And that's what I encourage you guys, the young people of the word, to get into your Bible. It is not a boring book. If you saw the things that Jesus did... And if you saw it today, people would be like, Jesus, you can't do that. I mean, like, goodness gracious, you can't do that in the church. I mean, they were doing some corrupt stuff. And then Jesus comes in, and he starts flipping temple tables. I've always wanted to find, like, some real corrupt church and just go in and start flipping stuff. And then be like, it's in the Bible. I can do it. Watch out, people. It would be crazy. I actually tried to get a youth group to do it one time. We were like, yeah, it's a bad idea. So we're not going to do it. But... But you know what? If you read the Bible, it is exciting. Jesus did amazing things. He shook up the establishment of religion for a reason. Because everyone was stuck in following these rules without relationship. Okay? If you know what it's like to have a relationship where someone never talks to you, but just tries to, you know, keep you... That it doesn't work that way. It's not how relationships work. So if you want to see a powerful relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to get to know him more. You need to be in your word daily. This isn't something we just do on Sunday or Wednesday night at youth group. This is something we do every single day to get to know the person who saved us from eternity in hell, to have a relationship with God our Father, to be able to receive the Holy Spirit, to be able to go into this world with power. That's an amazing thing, and we should never take that for granted. There's countries all over the world where, where they're not even allowed to preach the gospel. They're not allowed to talk about the Bible. I, I was at a, a, a concert in Philadelphia a couple months ago, and uh, I was talking to this one guy because I'm planning on going to China. Uh, I skateboard for this company in, uh, um, in uh, Florida, and they're called Wisdom Skateboards, and we're planning eventually to go to China, and we have some connections out there. And it is so amazing to hear what the church is doing in China. They're not allowed to read the Bible. They're not allowed to have that. But their underground churches are the most passionate group of believers that are probably on the face of the earth right now. Because they know what they believe. They go after it no matter what the consequences. I heard a story about this one uh, preacher from America that went over to share the gospel and preach. And he was preaching, I, don't, I forget exactly what, but it's somewhere in the Old Testament. Okay? You know, we got the Old Testament and the New Testament, just in case, you know, make sure to clear that up. Well, he was preaching somewhere in the Old Testament. And these people are so passionate about the word of God that he was like, you know what, like me, I'll probably preach for like, you know, 20, 30 minutes, um, you know, an hour if we were just blessed today. So we'll, we'll see how I feel after that. I'm not going to do that to you guys. But, you know, uh, you know, where he would be preaching for maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and he was preaching on a passage in the Old Testament. They would not let the man stop preaching. They made him preach all the way through to Revelations. They were there for like probably over 10 hours. Because they wanted the word of God. And so that's what I want you to realize. We have the freedom and the privilege and the honor to be able to open up in a public place like this. To be able to come here and worship God. To have fun. Who, who believes that it's fun to worship Jesus? Yeah? Come on. That's amazing. Because guess what? There's a group of people out there that don't think that's a thing. But right here, I would believe that that's evidence that that happened. I mean, we've had some fun. I'm still sweating. And it's great. But what I want you to re realize is, is we have that privilege. We have that freedom. Never take it for granted. Get to know who King Jesus is. Submit to his authority. Learn what he did. Because you need to know that there are people out there. The Bible refers to them as, as uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. These people that are crooked, that are going to try to uh, preach a, a false gospel. That isn't true. But you guys, if you are in your word, you're going to be able to be like, wait a second. That doesn't sound right. You don't know my Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who loved me, who died for my sins, who went up to people, who ate with the sinners and the tax collectors. He said, you know what? Sick, or, or healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people do. And you know what? Look at what's going on in this world that's full of sick people right now. And then people want to be like, no, no, no. We're too good to help them. No. It's like, are you kidding me? 
Did you read the Bible ever in your life? Because Jesus was going after those people. And that's what you guys are going to be doing. And that's a beautiful thing. We're not supposed to be quiet about this. We're supposed to go and say, hey, there's a sickness in this world. And I have the cure. His name is Jesus Christ. That's amazing. And we should be giving God glory to just be able to say, I'm going to worship you, King Jesus. I'm going to fall under your authority. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And I will follow you wherever you lead. And the next letter is E in keys. And it is effective. All right? So the first uh, part of effective is talking about a new creation. This is probably one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Their old has gone, and their new has begun. And I, there's other translations that say the old is gone, and behold, all things are new. Okay? So I've got a little object lesson. I just want to show you a, a little illustration. So this is a skateboard. From when I was probably 16 years old, I was living over in 44, and I got these, like, blank decks off of eBay. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to start a Christian skateboard company. It did not go that well, but we had some fun anyway. So basically, we spray painted some crosses, and instead of NIV, we put NSV, which meant new skate version. Yeah, it was kind of lame, but, you know, I was 16 years old. I thought it was cool. Yeah, we got one here. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, so this is one of the skateboards from when all the way back when 10 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Guys, I think I'm getting old. Oh, 10 years. Anyway, let's pray for me to not be old. But anyway, so this is a skateboard from back then. What happened was this board snapped right in the center. And we tried to skate it the rest of the day like this. But there is no way I was trying to jump down like a 10 stair or anything like that because it would not go well. Have you ever seen anybody, like, videos on YouTube of somebody, like, jumping down a stair set or doing a handrail and the board snaps? Yeah. That is not fun. I can say from experience. I spent about over an hour yesterday trying to land one trick. I fell on my butt so hard that my chest hurts. I don't know why that's even possible, <laughs> but I did. And uh, so we can pray for healing over my body today. But, you know, it says that if you are, uh, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Your old is gone, your new has come. So for me... To be able to continue to skate on this would be pure stupidity. Like, it's just dumb. Like, that's not a good idea. But for me, to put on a new creation, the parallel here is some people try to walk through life. They know of Jesus Christ, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It says, not if you know of Jesus Christ, you're in the creation. It says, if you are in Christ, if you belong to Christ, you have become a new person, a new creation. Your old is gone, your new has come. So that's why I wanted you to think about it. If you have that relationship, you need to think, you know what, there may be things in your past. I know you guys are young, but you're not, you know, immune from what happens in this world. There may be things in your past, darkness, uh, whatever it is, you know it, and, and I pray that you talk to somebody to, to be able to, to heal from those things. But if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And so if I were to go, I would say, you know what, I'm going to put on a new skateboard because I know I can be effective that way. I need to put on a new creation. So you know what, I, and... You probably heard in the video, I struggled in my past. Uh, I, at one point, I, I was really far from Christ, and I started believing some really stupid lies that the enemy was putting in front of me. And I thought my life wasn't worth living anymore. And I was suicidal. But I had to believe, you know what? If I'm in Christ, I, I can't believe those lies because I know what Jesus says about me, that he loves me, that God sees me as, you know what, Abba Father in the Bible uh, is referred to Abba Father a couple times, which is just an intimate word for Father, which means pretty much like Daddy. It's an intimate word. And it's a beautiful thing because we don't just see God as some distant Father because, you know what, I don't know what your Father figure is at home, but God, your Father, intimately cares about every detail of your life. He is not distant. He does not want to be far from you. He wants to be close to you. And so that's why I want you to realize that, you know what, I, I, I can't believe those lies from my past. I need to put on my new creation. And, and another, uh, another thing with effectiveness is comfortability. And uh, uh, there's this verse that talks about whether you're hot or cold, and it's in Revelation. It says, I know all these things you do, that you need, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you, would, you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm, neither, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's pretty brutal. I would not want to be spit out of somebody's mouth. So basically, I brought this chair because the one time I was preparing to preach this message to a church, and I was like, God, I want, I want you to give me a new illustration. Like, what's something else I could say that would connect with people to help them understand what's going to hold us back from being effective? And so I bought this chair at Target, and I'll tell you what, it is so comfortable, and it's amazing. 
So I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I was preparing for this message. I was like praying, and boom, I'm out. I'm completely like asleep. I was not very effective in studying, not effective in anything because I was asleep. And so the reason I say that is sometimes we try to stay so comfortable. You know, the fact that you're here today in this hot building, worshiping Jesus, having fun, getting out of your comfort zone, saying hi to new people, and just having a blast, that means you're, 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 you're beginning to say, oh, I, I'm going to get out of my comfort zones. And, and as we pursue reaching out to our community, there are going to be things that are uncomfortable. Like, I, I usually don't share these types of stories, but this morning I, I was driving to work, and I will be honest, I am worse with setting alarms because, like, I'll set, like, five of them, and the first one goes off, and I'll shut off all the other ones because I'm like, nah, man, I'm going to go to sleep, and I'm not going to get up right now. And so my boss is cool because, like, I, I'm late, like, every day, and he is too, so it's cool. So I was, I was pretty extraordinarily, I was going to be, like, 30 minutes late for work this morning. And all of a sudden, on my way to work, I'm getting pretty close, and all of a sudden I get a text from my boss. He's like, oh yeah, I, uh, I slept in this morning, I'm gonna be late. I'm like, sweet, he's later than I am, that's awesome. This is gonna work <laughs> out great for me today. So basically, I, I was like, all right, God, I've got a couple extra minutes, like what do you want me to do? And so there's this area, I, I work in a town called Carlisle, and uh, so I was driving, and there's this one area where there's always like at least one homeless guy standing. And I had a couple extra minutes this morning, and, and I stopped and I saw this guy holding up a sign. I was just praying. I was like, God, like, sh should I keep going? Like, what, what do I do? And, and it was it was hard because, you know, I, I am an evangelist. I go out and I get to preach the gospel all over the place. And, it, and I'll be honest, it's a lot easier to preach the gospel on stage than it is to go up to somebody on the street and preach the gospel. I'm being completely honest with you. It is difficult. And, and I, I need prayer for that because I can't just do that on my own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and reach these people. So I went over and, and I began to, to speak to this man and, and, and hear his story and hear what was going on, what led to where he's at right now. And I was able to, uh, thankfully, my, my parents' church does this thing where they make these bags that they put certain supplies in for people that are homeless, uh, some, like, some food and like some socks and things like that that homeless people just – they need because they're living on the streets. And so thankfully I had one of those and I went up and I was talking to him and I just got to, to talk to him a little bit about, you know, who I was and, and what I've been through a little bit and that, you know, I had a relationship with Jesus and that I had hope because of Jesus. And I was able to pray with this man and talk to him and preach the gospel and say, you know what, brother, I, I'm here for you. I'm praying and, 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 and believing that Jesus is going to do something in your life. And just seeing Somebody, like, he, he was blown away. Like, he was like, why, why would you, like, even stop? Like, it, it blows people's mind when you actually love people like Jesus loved them. That's something that's going to radically change this world and this community. If you love people like Jesus loved you, you all have sin in your life. You all have brokenness. The book of Romans says, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We have all fallen short. I don't care if you go around and do a good deed for every single person here. It's not about how we measure up. It's about how Jesus Christ said, you know what? You can't pay the bill, but I'm going to come here and I'm going to pay it for you. You can't measure up. So through Jesus Christ saying, you know what? I knew that you had an eternity somewhere else, but I'm going to step in. And I love you. In your brokenness and your sin and all these things, I love you. That same love that was given to you if you have Christ Jesus as your Savior is something you don't keep to yourself, but you share with the world. And I really just pray that this, these next couple days as you guys are doing this, send me 16, that you guys would really chase after that. I've only got a couple more points here. The next one is why, which is you. You know, some people think, uh, can God use me? Because, you know, I go around and I get to share the, about the skate park ministry I work with. We go to, like, Creation Festival, um, Uprise Festival. We go to uh, different places all over the world. And it's awesome. And people are like, oh, man, I wish God could use me like he uses. Why not? Why not? Like, seriously, I ask you, why not? Why can God not use you in a powerful way? The same God that if you look in the Old Testament... And you see how Elijah and the prophets of Baal and how he called down fire from heaven. It, the same God. That's your God too. He can do anything. There is nothing impossible through God. 
Like, we need to grab hold of that and realize that we can't just stay in our comfort zones. We can't afford to just think about ourselves. Because the, the, the country we live in is very consumerism. There's all this consumerism. It's all about me, me, me. And that's the way our country functions. But we are not called to conform to society. We are called to follow the kingdom of God. We are called to be lovers of Jesus Christ. To see that God can do amazing things in my life and I can share that with others. That I can bless other people because he has blessed me. And so there's a, a verse in, in um, 1 Corinthians 1.27. It said, instead, God chose the things the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that, uh, that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. That is an amazing God. Because you know what? I, I'll be honest. Every time I get up to speak and share, I, I have a hard time believing that all those years ago when I was a kid that I would be where I am today. That I would be even be speaking in public. Who's heard of Camp Orchard Hill? Yeah? Oh, that place is amazing. And I get to go spend a whole week there next week. I'm so excited. It's going to be weird. I'm used to speaking to like people your age, like youth and young adults. I'm going to be speaking to like really little kids. So it's going to be interesting. We'll see how that goes. But, you know, uh, when I went to that camp my first time, I was 14 years old, back in 2004. Man, that was a long time ago. Back in 2004, I went there, uh, and I was shy. You may not believe that right now, but I was super shy. I was scared to talk to other people. By the end of that week, okay, if you've been to camp before, you know that there's a campfire night where you get to get up and speak in front of everybody and share what God's doing in your life. I got up twice. I was like, you know what? Oh my goodness, like I, I felt this confidence that I've never felt before. And you know, I grew up with uh, just multiple learning disabilities and, and ADHD and, and all these things that, you know, I, I'll never forget when I was in like first grade, I had a teacher that told my mother, your kid's not college material. I'm like, I'm in first grade, are you a crazy woman? Are you kidding me? College material? I'm like, I'm still trying to get two plus, no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> You know, it's funny because there are people, even Christians and other people, that want to speak negatively about what God wants to do in your life. He wants to use you to do powerful things. So I don't care how weak you may feel. I don't care how useless you may feel. If you put that in the hands of God, you have no limitations. There is nothing that can stop you. I believe that you can see this local area become just completely on fire for God. And I believe a, young, a, a group of young people can do that. Like, why not? Because sometimes we think that we need a, a revival of, okay, unless there's a thousand people here, then there's not going to be a revival. No, no, that's not how that works. It, it is amazing. If you look at in, uh, Judges 6, Wayne Morgan and I were just talking about this earlier, it, and uh, I love the story of Gideon. Gideon was this coward. Like, he was straight up. He was a coward. He was trying to, like, hide this stuff from the enemy so he could, you know, not interact. And, and God called him, a, like, a warrior. And he ends up calling him to lead this army. So they started off with 32,000 people. All right? Stay with me now. 32,000 people. Okay? And then God was like, hmm, I'm going to take away 22,000 of those people. I'd have been like, if I was leading that army, I'd be like, God, you do not know what you're talking about. You are crazy. That is not going to work. But he did. He took 22,000 people away. And if you've read the passage, you know he doesn't stop there. <laughs> he continues on. He takes away ten, or he takes away the rest of the group until there's only three hundred people left. And the reason he did that is because he wanted to say, you know what? It, it's not about the numbers. I don't want you to win this battle saying that oh, we have the strongest, biggest army, and that's why we won. He wanted his, he wanted them to be able to say, the God of this army is the reason why we won. You know what? You guys are a group of young people. And I believe that you guys are an army for Jesus Christ. You guys are an army for the will of God. That you guys can do anything. Like, I, I cannot overemphasize this enough. You can do anything. You can. And it's not because there is, you know, people all the way up in there and out in the, you know, we've got all the, no, that's not what it's about. It's about the fact that the God of your army is bigger than anything going on out there. Anything going on out there. And I believe that God is going to use this generation. And not just this generation. I believe that this group of young people. You guys. You guys. Look to your neighbor and say, God's going to use you. Yes. Right? It's true. So believe it. He's going to use you. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, God is amazing. He 
really is. And we're going to get on to this last letter. If the band wants to come up, uh, we're going to get into another worship set here in a moment. But the last letter is S, and it's sacrifice. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this earthly body, by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. It's not, oh, no longer that me that lives. It's no longer this old nature. But I am a new person in Christ. I am alive in Christ. I just want to share a, a quick quote. Uh, I talked about this band for today earlier. And there's a guy in the band, his name is Matty Montgomery, and there's this quote which we'll put up here on the screen. It says, I believe that every step Jesus took on the way to the cross was not something he was doing so you wouldn't have to. It was something he was doing to show you how. I'm going to say that again, and I want you to really focus in on this because this is very important. I believe that every step Jesus took on the way to the cross was something he was doing, so he was not something he was doing, so you wouldn't have to. It was something he was doing to show you how. So do you realize that Jesus Christ, as he had to take these steps to the cross, let's stay focused in, as he took these steps to the cross, he had to take these painful steps, after being beaten, after being ridiculed, after having a crown of thorns shoved onto his head, after being spit at, after being stripped half naked in front of crowds, to go through all that pain, to go through all that misery. There was a reason behind all of it. He had your name in mind. He was doing that. In every whip, in every step, he was crying out that I love you. Like, think about that. Your sins, every sin you've committed, he was saying, you know what? I love you. And, and you know what? We're going to go into a world that does not love Jesus. You can say, you can say God in the generality of any, any other name. But the second you say the name of Jesus, people start to get offended. People start to tell you you can't talk about it. But the amazing thing is that when we, when we say the name of Jesus, powerful things happen. I'm going to say that again. When we say the name of Jesus, when we firmly go into our schools, into our communities, and into our churches, because let's be honest, I believe that the church needs revival as much as anything else. Because sometimes we can miss the point. We can get back just like the old days with Jesus where we've gotten into a religion and legalism. And we're so focused on the rules and the colors of the carpet and how loud or how quiet and this and that and all the stupid things. Because that doesn't matter. It matters that we are passionately in love with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about, if you ever see somebody who's married and they're kind of in love, that doesn't exist. But you see people that, you know, they just, they just get by. That but you ever see somebody who's like passionately in love with someone? They're not afraid to make a fool of themselves. To go after that. I'm looking at my mom and dad right now. Mom and dad, raise your hand real quick and say hi. That's my mom and dad. Their marriage is one of the most rad things I've ever seen in my life. They're what, coming up on 30 years in February, right? 38 years. You gotta be passionately in love to put up with somebody for 30 years. I'll tell you that. Like somebody puts up with me for 25 years, 26 years, that's insane. They love me too, so I guess that works, you know. But I see them as people who are passionately in love with each other because they get what it means to have a Savior, a Jesus Christ who died for them and passionately loves them. So you know what? Even though sometimes we'll be in public and they're all smoochy and being all cute and such, and I'm like, guys, knock it off. I'm an adult and I'm still embarrassed. Knock it off. It's okay because they love each other. Now are we going to go into this world, into our communities, and in the fall, back to our schools, saying, I'm in love with Jesus and I don't care who thinks it's weird because it's not about you. It's not about what you feel. It's about knowing that, man, I have been saved by Jesus. Holy 
could just bow our heads.